add to the scenery, let's bring in Albert Breer, <laughs> the senior NFL Lovely. reporter, lead content strategist for the Monday Morning Quarterback. Oh. He's just known as the Monday Morning Quarterback, in my opinion. Oh. Kind enough to join us. I don't, know, I don't know what scenery you're adding to. Jeff, would you go? Yeah, if you want to. Okay. Um, yeah, it's interesting you asked about Travis Kelsey. I asked Chad Henney about that because I, I had um. You, you can know, pull that microphone yeah. a little bit closer to you. I had seen on Twitter, like you see over and over again, like, hey, you might want to cover 87, right? So I, I like after like the divisional game, I I asked Chad Henney, I'm like, so like what is it? Like how, how come no one can get? Like, obviously he'd be the number one priority for any defense. Yeah. And Chad Henney says because he was a high school quarterback. And Travis, Travis Kelsey was a high school quarterback, and Chad said he sees the field like a quarterback. So he sees the field the same way Mahomes does. So he knows how to set up coverage. He knows how to set a defender up. He knows how to use their leverage against them. Yeah. It's because he played quarterback in high school. He sees the field differently than a lot of other skill players. Yeah, so there you go. He's one of those guys, though, that you're right. I don't know if there's a true definition of why is he so great, but, you know, that kind of puts it into perspective yeah. of – a football player seeing it and plus I always wondered about that if you were a defensive back or a wide receiver and you played quarterback in high yep. school how does that help you see the field and uh, you know that certainly pertains to Travis Kelsey yep. all right a lot to get to uh, anything come out of media night that uh, the audience should be aware of <laughs> no <laughs> okay fair enough thanks I mean, for joining us Albert <laughs> Breer everybody I, appreciate I mean that. honestly though like that's not really for us right like no, that's it's not, not I mean I like, look, I, I think one thing that is noticeable is the amount, like, is the infrastructure of both teams, right? Like, and you see, okay, like, there is Shane Steichen and Jonathan Gannon, future head coaches on the Eagles staff. And then you look at the Chiefs staff and their established coordinators and Eric Bieniemy and Steve Spagnolo, And then you see further down the line, guys like Brian Johnson and Kevin Petullo, who probably ha are on a head coach trajectory. So I think one thing you saw – like the depth of the rosters, the depth of the coaching staffs, the depth of the scouting staffs, like it really is two organizations that really have a lot of things working. When Nick Sirianni took over and had that initial press conference, we goofed on him. Yep. Um, I could now all of a sudden he's found his voice. He's found out yeah. who he is here. What's the what led him to this point? What's I think it's I actually think like looking back at it now. I had a similar experience with Nick. Like, the first time I got him on the phone, I didn't know him at all. And this was when he was the Colts offensive coordinator. And it was like a 10-minute phone call where it was like pulling teeth talking to him. You know what I mean? Like, it felt like I couldn't get anything out of him. It was awkward. It was weird. And then, you know, I, I got to actually meet him in person, and it was totally different. And I think, like, one of the things, what, like, what you see, like, with and what we all saw in that first press conference is actually part of his greatest strength. He's comfortable in his own skin. Yeah. He doesn't care what other people think about him. And I, I've said this to, to a lot of different people. Like, he might be the most normal guy among the 32 NFL head coaches. And I think then you look at his staff, and they're all guys who are in the same age range. And they all have kids who are the same age. And then the atmosphere that creates in the building, where everybody's sort of all in, and everybody's sort of on the same page. And I just... I think he's found a way to create an environment that is <laughs> remarkable. It sounds weird, remarkably normal. And I think the players, because of that, like coming to work every day. So you have, and I've had people there say this to me, like the weight room is full at 6 a.m. You know what I mean? It's stuff like that, like where no one ever sees it, but it's, again, kind of about like an organization all pulling in one direction. I think a huge part of that is Nick's own personality and that, people rally around him because he's a normal guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and it's yeah. just, you know, I, I think the worst thing you can be as a head coach is somebody who's trying to be somebody else or tr somebody who's trying to project, you know? Nick is unapologetically himself, and obviously it's worked. You got some coaching vacancies. Yeah. I didn't know if they're vacant because you have coaches in the Super Bowl who they might be considering. Right. But let's start here in Arizona. Yep. Why is this job still open? I... <laughs> I've had a couple of people say to me that maybe the owner likes the fact that people are talking about his team during Super Bowl week. So that was one theory <laughs> that this has wow. been dragged out this way, like because it's part of it is. Is this a positive thing that you don't have a head coach? Well, that, that, that people are talking about the Cardinals, you know, so. Like I mean, any publicity is good publicity? I, I mean, I guess the old Jerry Jones thing, right? Like, 
you know, three minutes on ESPN, three minutes on ESPN. Right? But does this come down to who wants to coach Kyler Murray? I, I, I don't think it's so much that. Like, I do think part of it is that they, they hired a general, they wanted to hire their general manager first. And so they hired Monty Austin for it. This is also the first time they've sort of gone outside of their family to do an entirely new, like, setup, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so if you look at it, you go back to Mike Bidwell got the team from his dad or control like 07, 08. So when they were hiring, you know, Wizenhunt, well, they'd already had a sitting general manager in Rod Graves. Then they hired, the, they fired those two guys. They promote Steve Kime. Steve Kime hires Bruce Arians. And then when they fire, or when Bruce Arians walks away, Kime hires Wilkes, then Kime hires Kingsbury. They'd never really done this before. And so, like, I think that that's a part of it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, like a huge piece of it was sort of figuring out what they want. And so, um, you know, I think that the, the, the fact that this is dragged out a little bit does open up the possibility, though, and I know a lot of people around the league think that is the potential there that if they're dragging this out, so if it doesn't work with, they're talking to Mike Kafka, the Giants offensive coordinator today, they were supposed to talk to Brian Flores tomorrow, Flores backed out because he took the Vikings DC job, and then Lou Anarumo, the Bengals DC on Friday, are they dragging this out? So if they're not enamored with Kafka today or Anarumo, on Friday that now they can talk to the Eagles coordinators on Monday. And uh, they missed the window to talk to the Eagles coordinators the first time around, which meant they weren't allowed to talk to them during the Eagles bye week. So they have to wait till Monday if they want to talk to Jonathan Gannon or Shane Steichen. I put J.J. Watt in an uncomfortable spot yesterday. I did, yeah, I ask, him, I did ask him <laughs> about <laughs> Kyler Murray. Um, he kept asking me what I thought of Kyler Murray, and I, I just I don't know what the, the sense, the feeling is. I, I said to J.J. Watt, I said, look, Kyler Murray had it so easy in high school, and, yep. you know, he goes to Oklahoma and had it easy there, you know, in that offense there. Yep. Uh, played baseball. I mean, everything came to him naturally. Yep. But, but, you know, playing quarterback in the NFL is not, hey, I got the most ability. Patrick Mahomes has unbelievable ability, but he's, he's a leader. Right. And puts in the time. Mm -hmm. And that's, like, what do you hear about Kyler Murray? I, like, I think that the, if you're, if, if he's the guy that, like, you're looking to, like, he hasn't been the guy to set the tone for the rest of the organization, and that's been problematic for them. Yeah. And so, like, if you want your quarterback to be sort of the head of the snake, right, like, and the guy who is going to put natural peer pressure on everybody else to work their ass off and to be the first one in the building and to set the tone for the entire organization. He hasn't been that. And it really goes back to who he is. And I actually think it relates to his baseball background. Like the huge, the big knock on him coming out of Oklahoma was, well, he's a baseball player. So he's sort of an independent contractor. And like he wasn't part of spring practice in college as a quarterback, which is different because of baseball. And so... Like, it's always been for Kyler Murray. It's not that he doesn't work hard. It's that, like, a lot of his work is directed differently than it is for other quarterbacks. So he's not around as much. And he's not going to be the guy who's pulling everybody in the same direction. Now, to, in his defense, like, he did get the guys together in Texas in the offseason, that sort of thing. But when your quarterback isn't showing up for half the offseason program, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because now, well are there a bunch of other third and fourth and fifth year players who are going to see that as license? Hey, I'm going to stay in Florida in, in April and May, and I'm going to show up June 1st. And how does that sort of flow into the summer when you're starting training camp? And then he's probably not going to start the season. Right. Because right. Of, you know, of his because of the ACL. Yeah. And so how much of his ACL recovery is going to be done here? Mm. Like, and how all in is he going to be with the new coach? And I think that's part of like the equation when you're looking at it, Dan, like I, if you're, if you have, if you, if you're Mike Kafka or you're, you have one shot at being a head coach, right? See, because most, most guys don't get a second shot. And you're going to have one shot at being a head coach. Like, what do you have, two or three years? The contract dictates that it's going to be really hard to walk away from Kyler Murray for that period. Yeah. So that's part of the equation coming here is that it's, you almost have to find a way to make it work with Kyler, which is sort of what Sean Payton's facing in Denver with Russell Wilson, too. Uh, Albert Breer, the Monday morning quarterback, joining us. Uh, Tom Brady said yesterday mm -hmm. that he's going to take the year off. Yeah. Um, do you think he does TV? I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that he's going to. I mean, I will say that I think if he does do TV, he's going to, I think he'll go all in and try to be really good at it. Um, I'm not convinced that he does it um, just because I do think that I hate to say it's beneath him. <laughs> you 
<laughs> but, but, but doesn't it sort of feel like, like, can you guys see him like standing in the buffet line with the rest of us at halftime? <laughs> you know? Waiting in line to take a pee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Is any, anybody got kale? Can I get some kale around here? Some avocados? Like, like it really wasn't, it was never hard for me to wrap my head around the idea of Tony Romo doing that, right? It's not even hard to like wrap your head around the idea of Troy doing that. You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around the idea of Tom Brady standing in that line yeah. waiting for a hot dog. Yeah. You know what I mean? So um, <clears throat> I do think, like, you got to look at the Mannings and what they're doing, or you have to look larger than that, like Elway got into ownership. Yeah. It feels like Tom is more of the guy who greets you in his suite, and he's the owner and or, you know, yeah. part of an ownership group. I mean, like, is it Magic Johnson? Is that his future? You know what I mean? Like, I just feel like... To satisfy his competitive, like that, because I think that's what, what, I think one of the big reasons, one of the things that most people miss about him, I think one of the things that kind of kept him going was the fear of losing that outlet, the competitive outlet, because he is such a maniac when it comes to competition. And like, I, I don't think it was ever searching for a fairy tale ending or getting back at people in New England, improving people. I think for him, it was like a, like a, an addiction almost to competition. And I do think like going and being part of an ownership group and getting into team building might satisfy that to a degree. Would television satisfy that? If he goes to the games, right? then you prepare for both teams. You're right. preparing for both defenses. And that I think would get those competitive juices flowing. Yeah. It's, it's what Drew Brees missed out on. Right. He was in the studio. And there's no magic in the studio. you got to create magic. The game creates yeah. magic, and therefore you go out there, then you feed off that excitement. Right. And therefore I think that would work with Brady. But I'm just shocked that he's not doing anything for Fox this week. And I thought send a camera crew to Tampa and just say, Tom, I want you to prepare for both of these defenses, right. and I want you to talk about both of these quarterbacks. So I got you know him in the film room breaking things down. Doesn't have to be out here. Doesn't have to be on the set. Right. But you can kind of bring him into the Fox family. And it'd be a great dry run for him yeah. to see what it's like. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, it's, an, it's relatively, it's not heavy lifting, you know, And you for get him. a couple of takes. You're going to make sure he looks great. You could stop it and say, all right, let's try it again. Yeah. You're not live TV. Nobody's going to be judging you. We talked about this before. It still feels like if you wanted somebody to be themselves, because you always hear, hey, just be yourself. Troy Aikman said to Tom, his advice, hey, just be yourself. The one guy who could be himself as an analyst who's not employed as an analyst is who? Who could? Jay Cutler. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think Cutler, like... I, he doesn't care, right? I, I honestly thought... I felt this way all along. Like, I think Cutler... Like, he had the deal to do it, right? Like, yeah. he had the deal with Fox, and then Tannehill tears up his knee, and Adam Gase gets him to come to Miami for $10 bucks. I, like, I think Jay Cutler would have been the guy who is, A, he's intelligent, and B, he doesn't give a crap what <laughs> anyone thinks. Like, he doesn't care. Like, he's not looking. He wouldn't be in the booth looking down like, oh, well, I got beers with the right guard out there like three weeks ago, so I can't say anything. But no, like, he wouldn't care, you know? So, um, yeah, I think Cutler would have been really, I, really I good I just think it. it'd be hard. Cause Tom spent his entire life not criticizing or saying anything. Right. And now you're going to say, Tom, be yourself. Go out there and critique. Yeah. You know, be honest. I just don't see, you know, him wanting to do well, that. And I just, yeah, I just don't know where, I mean, that's the thing. It, like, I also, like, sort of look at him and how many different ways is he compromised? You know what I mean? Like, is, like with everything, because he's been so image conscious for his entire NFL career. And part of it is, like, you know, like I think he looks at like, okay, like I'm invested with this person, and, I'm in, and he's incredibly loyal. Is he compromised? You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. where it's just he can criticize this person, but then I can't criticize that, and that can be really, really tricky. You know? Did you hear Belichick on his podcast? Yeah, it was a love fest. He right? was gushing. Yeah. Well, have you ever heard Belichick talk about Lawrence Taylor? Yes. <laughs> I mean, like, oh. yes. So he really loves Lawrence I, I, Taylor. I, I, I had to, like, I, I can remember um, talking to Drew Bledsoe about this, right? So, you know, Drew obviously had a really ugly exit from New England, and it was tough, and it was something that it took years for him to reckon with, right? And um, Drew told me, he's like, so he, I think it was when he went back for the Patriot Hall of Fame induction, and he hadn't seen Belichick since. 
<laughs> and um, and so, you know, so he goes back to Foxborough, and he and and he still gets got along great with Robert Kraft. Like it was Kraft's first quarterback, everything like that. He knew that would be great and everything. But he was actually like Drew Bledsoe, a former NFL quarterback, was nervous about going back and seeing Bill. And uh, and Drew told me like you know so he walks in and they have a stadium practice the weekend of the uh, inter- for season ticket holders the the weekend of the uh, of the of the um, ceremony. And Drew walks out on the field, and Bill comes walking over to me, gives him a hug, and like, like warm as like can be. And Drew said he was like sat there silent for like two minutes, like <laughs> what the hell is this? <laughs> but I, but I think that's part of it is like when you like Bill is so good at compartmentalizing. So you're either in his professional life, and I've heard this from so many people. You're either in his professional life or you're in, in his personal life. And once guys retire they get moved like they're like cat like from one category to the next and i'm sure that's what it is is like I as long as, like, as as long as tom was in the nfl he was part of bill's professional life now yeah. it's just part of bill's personal life. yeah i think he likes you uncomfortable when you play for him or you're not quite sure um lamar jackson's playing for who next year i think the ravens but i'm less sure of it than i was a year ago um if not the ravens you want to say the Dolphins because there's so many natural reasons for it. I, 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 I believe the Dolphins when they say, like, they want to give it another run with Tua. I think the problem that the Dolphins run into is that fifth-year option. They've got to make a decision on yeah. the fifth-year option. There's the concussion issue. Now, that's a 25 to $30 million decision. And if you pick up his option, those are fully guaranteed now. You're locking yourself into Tua for 2024. If you don't pick it up, now you're in a year-to-year proposition with your – you're in a year-to-year situation with your quarterback. So does that make you view it differently? And if the opportunity to trade for a Lamar Jackson comes along, do you look at it and say, well, this might make some more sense for us, yeah. you know? Uh, so I, I, I think the issue is, like, how you bridge the gap if, like, between – like, so the, the Ravens are willing to give him a top-of-the-market traditional quarterback deal. Lamar wants a Deshaun Watson deal. So, like, how do you kind of, like, how, how, do you, how do you bridge the two? And they've been unable to do it. And I think Lamar, like, you can understand why the Ravens would be hesitant. You can also sort of understand Lamar's point of view, where it's like, I put my body on the line for five years for you, and now you're asking me for injury protection three years from now? Like, you know what I mean? Like, if you were Lamar, seriously, though, like, you at, like, look what you put me, like, you have put an unprecedented amount of stress on my body as a quarterback. Never has a quarterback been deployed that way ever, right? Run that much ever, yeah. right? And I did that for five years for you. And now you're asking me to sign a contract that's going to protect you three years from now. So if, all, if I have to pay the price for all of this, you aren't going to have to pay that price with me. I don't think this is about the money for Lamar. I think this is principle. Like, I felt that way because like, he thinks about these things differently. If it was about money, he would have just taken the deal. That's a lot of – you know, if this was just a financial decision, he finished the last two years injured, just take the contract. Get your $150 million guarantee to be done with it, you know? Yeah. I think for for Lamar, like, I really believe this about him. Like, he's always done things differently, and I do think this is about principle for him. He's Albert Breer, the Monday Morning Quarterback. Thank you for all your contributions the entire season. Yeah, absolutely. We, we love and when we'll you're on. we'll keep it going in the offseason. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, Albert Breer, the Monday Morning Quarterback. We'll take a break here. we got our play of the day up next, Dan Patrick Show.